Capturing all of our hearts since 1996, the mainline Pokemon games are the meat of the most successful multimedia franchise in history. And with the recent release of Scarlet and Violet's Indigo Disc DLC, we feel like it's the perfect time to ask, which of these games are truly the best? I'm Kyle with Pokebinge, and this is every mainline Pokemon game worst to best. Now, while there really aren't any mainline Pokemon games that we would consider awful, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl left very much to be desired. Remember when they said in that Pokemon Presents that these were going to be faithful remakes of Diamond and Pearl? Well, they weren't wrong, and that turned out to be a bad thing in the long run. Aside from a few cool new additions like the expansion of the Underground to the Grand Underground, and Pal Park to Ramones Park, as well as following Pokemon and no HMs. They're really just the originals with a new coat of paint. When looking at other remakes, they have elements of the original's third versions, like Heart Gold and Soul Silver having elements from Crystal, and Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire having elements from Emerald. Following this same pattern, you would expect Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl to have elements from Platinum, right? Well, aside from Pokemon forms like Rotoms and Giratinas that were introduced and the Elite Four and Cynthia having their Platinum teams upon rematch, slim to none. Yeah, that means no Battle Frontier. So if you don't want what's essentially a repeat of the original Diamond and Pearl, you might want to skip these ones. And let's hope ILCA never gets their hands on another mainline game again. Following up with another remake on the Switch, Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee are next. We all know Game Freak likes to put their Kanto favoritism on full display, but they decided to throw us a curveball, no pun intended, and give us Yellow remakes. Like Yellow, we get a starter that doesn't want to evolve or stay in its Pokeball, so that makes it fun to use a Pokemon that isn't fully evolved on your team. The most unique feature that was advertised was that wild Pokemon have to be caught using the Joy-Cons instead of battling them to simulate Pokemon Go. A second player can also be spawned to help in capturing Pokemon. These are fun features, especially for shiny hunters, but the Let's Go games are brought down by a number of other features. First of all, they're way too easy, which can be a turnoff for hardcore players. There's no held items and no abilities, likely to make things less complicated for a younger demographic. There's no change to the story from Yellow, which isn't an issue, but the new characters are weak, especially the new tribal, Trace, who is extremely bland. All in all, the Let's Go games are perfect for young kids who want to get into Pokemon, or even if you're a veteran who just wants to breeze through Kanto again. Now, making our way to the Alola region, we have Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. We're going to keep this one short and sweet because most of our criticisms will later apply to the original Sun and Moon. Speaking of, these games could have easily been made as DLC for the originals, as not much has changed story-wise. The additions that have been added, such as the Mantine Surf in the Ultra Warp Ride minigames and the Team Rainbow Rocket storyline are all great, but yet again, there was no reason to put these into a separate $40 game with minimal story changes. However, if there was one thing that really stood out, it's the Ultra Recon Squad storyline where the final battle with Ultra Necrozma is one of the most brutal and most difficult bosses in the entire series. So kind of long story short, check these out if you're a completionist or if you're really desperate for another romp in Alola. Continuing through the 3DS, X and Y take the next spot. These games introduced Mega Evolutions and the Amazing Fairy type, but how does everything else fare? Well, not the best. They are stupidly easy, and it's not at all difficult to overlevel the gym leaders, as well as the Elite Four and Champion, making them pretty forgettable in the process. And speaking of forgettable characters, the rivals, except for Kaleem slash Serena, are just kind of there. Seriously, name one thing about them that's not how much Tierno likes to dance. And while Team Flare is one of the most sinister evil teams in the series, even they are easily bowled over. What we can probably all agree on though is that Game Freak did Kalos dirty. Everything was there for a definitive Kalos game, especially the long-rumored Pokemon Z, 
if Zygarde's storyline in the X, Y, and Z arc of the anime is anything to go by. But no, they decided to shove the rest of Zygarde into Sun and Moon for some reason. Anyway, despite being mixed bags and full of missed opportunities, X and Y are still very fun and very much worth playing. Now, here's to hoping we get that Pokemon Z or something that can redeem Kalos in the future. On a more cheerful note, let's talk about the ones that started it all. Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow. These games set the groundwork for the rest of the series going forward. You pick your starter, you have a rival, and you get your gym badges while defeating an evil team on the way. And of course, you battle the Pokemon League to become champion, all while catching them all. While the formula has changed a bit a couple of times since then, it's never gotten old. And Kanto is still a classic region despite Game Freak constantly shoving it in our faces nowadays. Of course, the characters are the most recognizable in the series, from Blue, who started the trend of the beloved jerk rival archetype to Professor Oak, who still can't remember his grandson's name, to the gym leaders who were brilliantly brought to life in the anime's first season. Yellow is nearly identical to Red and Blue, except it reflects the anime a bit more, with Pikachu being the starter and Jesse and James being rocket grunts. Not to mention it gets rid of those nightmare fuel Pokemon sprites. While Red, Blue, and Yellow have aged well in terms of being great casual pickup and play games, they also notoriously haven't aged well in the bug department. And no, we don't mean bug types, from harmless glitches like the badge boost glitch to potentially game-breaking ones like Masingo, the games are riddled with them. And it's even crazier when you learn the international versions of the games were made to patch up the even buggier Japanese red and green. But you know what? There's something oddly charming about Gen 1's glitches for some reason. And regardless, red, blue, and yellow are nothing short of iconic, and we owe the rest of the franchise to their massive success back in the 90s. And don't think we're done with Kanto just yet, because the original remix, Fire Red and Leaf Green, are up next. It's a breath of fresh air to play Gen 1 with Gen 3 mechanics and little to no glitches, like Steel and Dark types being present, and the special stat being separate make it definitely less jarring for players coming from more recent generations. And being the first remix, they start the trend of adding new features that weren't in the original, most notably the Sevi Islands, where there is an extended Team Rocket storyline and the presence of Gen 2 Pokemon. If you want the definitive way to experience Kanto, then Fire Red and Leaf Green are the games for you. Staying on the GBA, Ruby and Sapphire are up next. The first of the Gen 3 games introduced franchise staples, abilities, natures, double battles, and a much needed update to the Pokemon storage interface. We also got contests, which are far more fun than their Gen 4 counterparts, and yes, we will die on that hill. The games are not without their flaws, however. The number of Pokemon in the games are limited, which is understandable because the technological limitations of the GBA makes backwards compatibility impossible. Sure, more recent generations have limited Pokedexes too, but with current technology, you can now complete your Pokedex by trading with people online. With Ruby and Sapphire, if you're stuck with no one to trade with in person, or have no link cable to connect to other GBA games, or Colosseum and XD, you're just kind of out of luck. Also, backtracking can be a little tedious at times, not to mention your rival barely has any personality and they just disappear after Lily Cove City. Team Magma and Team Aqua are also kind of pathetic and sort of just present themselves as just one big slap fight. With all that said, make no mistake, Ruby and Sapphire are still great for what they are. They just pale in comparison to their remakes and Emerald, which we'll get to later. Returning to the Alola region, we now have the original Sun and Moon. Sun and Moon are unique in that they're 12 hours apart. When it's daytime in real time, it's daytime and sun, while it's the opposite in Moon. The games have deviated away from the normal gym leader formula and replaced it with the Island Challenge where you complete the trials on all four islands and defeat each kahuna. Z-moves are also introduced and can be an instant kill switch given the right circumstances, making them fun to use. And speaking of battling, the games are pretty difficult, which is a breath of fresh air compared to the painfully easy X and Y. And finally, no more HM moves. Game Freak actually got the message when we kept saying how tired we were of wasting team slots for Pokemon we'll never use in battle. And while those are all pretty high highs, the lows are pretty low. The biggest criticism is easily the pacing. Sun and Moon have by far the worst pacing in the entire series, with cutscenes that go on forever, and massive walls of text you have to go through, especially in the early game. 
And while quite a few characters are great, Luzamine, Lily, and Gladian in particular are some of Pokemon's most tragic figures. Others are quite the opposite. How is the biggest defender, as he's just another generic friendly rival, whose only real defining character trait is that he loves Malasadas. While it has some negatives, Sun and Moon is another fun experience that has a lot going for it. Moving on to the Johto region, we have Gold, Silver, and Crystal. Game Freak really outdid themselves with these titles. Not only did they make them better than Red, Blue, and Yellow, but they also expanded on them by making them direct sequels. As you get to explore Kanto after B Beating Johto. More mechanics that have become mainstays were introduced, such as held items, genders, a day and night cycle, breeding, and those oh so coveted shiny Pokemon. Not to mention the introduction of the steel and dark types, and the special stat being split into two. Crystal is mostly the same, except Suicune is the legendary that takes center stage, as well as the ability to catch both Ho Oh and Lugia, and the ability to choose a female player character, among other things. If we had one big criticism against Gold, Silver, Crystal, I guess it would be the level scaling. In comparison to other games, all the trainers have pretty low level Pokemon, and the wild Pokemon are at levels that make it a slog to level grind. Making this worse is that once you get to the post game, the Kanto gym leaders are at much lower levels than the Pokemon League, causing total whiplash just to fight Blue, whose levels are higher than Lance. At least this makes the epic fight against Red on Mount Silver an even bigger challenge if you don't grind your team up to the 70s. Level problems aside, Gold, Silver, Crystal were truly the original Ultimate Pokemon games and are yet another set of classics. Kicking off the legendary DS era, Diamond and Pearl are up next. Wi-Fi connectivity finally allowed people to trade Pokemon online, so you could complete your Pokedex even if you have no friends nearby. And online battling too. Now of course you're out of luck because the DS Wi-Fi services have been closed for almost a decade now. By far the single most important change to the battling mechanics has also been introduced. The physical special split. Pokemon's viable movesets have widened now that physical or special damage isn't determined by type. We Vile fans rejoice. Diamond and Pearl introduced the biggest, most important lore to the entire series, answering questions like how the Pokemon world formed and how space and time were created. They also gave us Team Galactic, who still has some of the darkest motives of any evil team. Now, of course, we do have to point out some of the flaws. The Pokedex is extremely limited, with not many options given during the main story. You've got a whole bunch of new evolutions of old Pokemon introduced in these games games, and they remain locked until the post game. The game's engine also makes it very slow at times. This makes backtracking especially super tedious, and notoriously a max HP Blissey's health bar from full takes a whopping 24 seconds to reach zero. Despite these flaws, Diamond and Pearl are still breakthrough titles, but keep an eye out as to why you should play Platinum over these. Moving back over to Hoenn, we have Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Many of the characters from the Gen 3 games have been made much more interesting, most notably Wally, who out of nowhere becomes a badass, and teams Aqua and Magma have become more flushed out and more complex. The additions of Primal Reversion for Groudon and Kyogre are simply awesome, and the new Mega Evolutions are also great. If only Ken Sugimori didn't get Artist's Block, because we would have gotten that Mega Flygon. We also get an incredible postgame in the Delta episode where we obtain the astronomically broken Mega Rayquaza and finally a way to get Deoxys legitimately without an event. The biggest missed opportunity Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire had was that we didn't get the Battle Frontier from Emerald. Instead, we see it under construction and in its place is X and Y's Battle Mason for some reason. That said, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire gave us another great adventure through Hoenn. But let's head over to Unova and talk about the final games of the DS era, Black 2 and White 2. These games have all you could ask for in a black and white sequel. An expanded Pokedex, character growth, as we see with people like Charon and Bianca, and a new storyline for Team Plasma. Many new features, which we unfortunately haven't seen since, have been introduced, like easy and hard modes, and the medals, which is effectively an achievement system. It really should have been a no-brainer to keep these in future games. You can also make your own films in Pokestar Studios, and battle almost every gym leader and champion up to that point in the Pokemon World Tour. Tournament. Also, special shout out to Getsis, who has become one of few characters in the entire series to have canonically committed attempted murder on a child, no less. 
Stay tuned for when we talk about the original black and white, as many of our praises from there also apply here. But for now, Black 2 and White 2 are underrated sequels to already great games. Now, we would be insane to not put Heart Gold and Soul Silver in the top half of our list. There's a reason why so many people hold these games in such high regard, and some still even consider them the best in the series. They are remakes of the already beloved Gen 2 games, and give them all the features and mechanics of the Gen 4 games. The expanded post-game containing many of the other legendaries from past generations is a dream come true for Gen 2 fans, while the return of Pal Park and Platinum's Battle Frontier are just the icing on the cake. You could even unlock special in-game events that presented new lore if you obtained the special Celebi and Arceus back in the day. Oh, how we miss the days when event Pokemon unlocked extra stuff. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that Pokemon could now follow you. Sure, they can follow you in newer games, but it just doesn't have the same feeling as it does here. While some issues in Heart Gold and Soul Silver persist, like the original game's level scaling problem and the other Gen 4 game's slow engines, that doesn't stop these from being absolute masterpieces. Just outside the top five are Black and White. It's so great to see these titles finally getting the love they deserve over 10 years later. When they first came out, they were the most divisive games amongst the fan base at the time, being criticized for having lazy po Pokemon designs like Vanillish and Garbodor, and only having the Gen 5 Pokemon available during the main story. Pretty petty if you ask us, because those people probably glossed over what great games these ended up being. The best graphics out of the DS Pokemon games, one of the best soundtracks in the series, one of the best characters in the series in N, and of course, sprite animations. It's a shame that Game Freak never gave us those animated sprites again, because they are so much more lively than the models that we have now. Speaking of things we'll never see again, the games also gave us the fun and unique triple and rotation battles, which saw a brief return in Gen 6 before disappearing. While it took some of the fanbase quite a number of years to warm up to them, black and white were always hidden gems that had a devoted following, and like we emphasized earlier, we're glad to see them finally getting the love they deserve. Now, we start our top 5 over in the Galar region with Sword and Shield. These titles tested out two major features that would be refined in later games, a vast open world presented in the form of the wild area, and wild Pokemon appearing outside of the tall grass. And we gotta say, we love it. We also love the fact that we can access the PC boxes at any time now, no longer having to run back to a Pokemon Center every time we need to deposit or withdraw a Pokemon. Of course, we also have to mention Sword and Shield's battle gimmick, Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing. While they are fun, our main criticism is that they're a bit too overpowered and could have had better balancing. But we can't lie, max raid battles are awesome. And speaking of awesome, the gym leaders are the best we've had since Black and White. They are all lively and unique, and the rivals have actual character development this time. For example, we see Bede go from a jerk rival to a humble young man, and we see Hop learn to no longer doubt himself after continuously thinking he will never follow in Leon's footsteps. Oh, and Leon is awesome, by the way. Sword and Shield are also the first games to include DLC, with the Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra including new stories, returning Pokemon Pokemon and new features. We'd like to particularly shout out Dynamax Adventures and the Galarian Star Tournament from the Crown Tundra. All in all, Sword and Shield have brought the series into a new direction, showing us all of the groundbreaking new places that it can go. Rounding out the DS era is Platinum. If you couldn't get past Diamond and Pearl's issues, then we present to you Platinum. It improves Diamond and Pearl in every way. It's slightly faster, especially when surfing, though that's not saying much. Backtracking is much easier, and the Pokedex is expensive. Expanded. We also got new forms like the beloved Rotom forms and Shaman's Ultra Broken Sky form. And of course, we got Origin form Giratina and the awesome Distortion World, which we hope to see again someday. Speaking of, Platinum also gave us a Battle Frontier. Please give us a Battle Frontier in Gen 10, Game Freak. That aside, our praises for Diamond and Pearl also apply here. So in short, Platinum fixed the flaws of those already great games and added some great content, which was just a massive W in our books. 
Starting the top three and taking the bronze medal for best Pokemon game, we make our final stop at both the Hoenn region and the handheld era with Pokemon Emerald. Pokemon Emerald features an expanded story that has both teams Magma and Aqua, with an iconic climax featuring Rayquaza. The game is also more difficult, but not too difficult as to be overwhelming. And the icing on the cake is a big post game. Pokemon outside the Hoenn Pokedex can be found, which was absent in Ruby and Sapphire. Not to mention you can capture both Groudon and Kyogre. Gym leaders can be rematched in double battles, where they have new Pokemon. And then of course, there's Battle Frontier, the pinnacle of Emerald's replayability value. Gen 4's Battle Frontier doesn't hold a candle to Emerald's. Seriously, the Battle Factory in particular is still addicting to this very day. Fanboying aside, Emerald has everything a third version should have, and is nothing short than a total masterpiece. Taking place in the Paldea region, our number two spot has to go to the most recent mainline titles, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Honestly, people hyper-focus on the bugs and performance issues way too hard, because when you look past that, these are great games. We were asking for games in which we could seamlessly travel across an open world and challenge gyms, in any order, for a long time now. This comes at the cost of no level scaling, which provides an extra challenge. We were also given the terrestrial phenomenon, which has flipped the competitive metagame on its head arguably more than any battle gimmick thus far. The cast of characters are easily the most unique in the series, as there's really no bad guy among them. Regardless of what you think of non-evil quote evil teams, you gotta admit, Team Star, consisting of a group of outcasts that have a history of being bullying victims, is a good take. Also, the idea of Professor Seda and Turo being AI clones of themselves at the climax is not only cool, but it also makes the end of Arvin's arc very sad. The recently released DLC, the Teal Mask and Indigo Disc, really knocks Sword and Shields out of the park because they feel like a continuation of the base game storyline, unlike the Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra which are just essentially side stories. Kitakami and Blueberry Academy are also expansive and offer great features like the former's Loyal 3 storyline and the latter's Terrarium. Overall, Scarlet and Violet have proven to be wonderful new additions to the series. And if you're willing to not totally obsess over the graphics, they're just fantastic experiences. Finally, the Hisui region is home to the top spot for the greatest mainline Pokemon game, in our opinion, Legends Arceus. Fans were waiting for years to have a game like this, and it really delivered. Being able to catch Pokemon from a long distance was a dream come true, as was having a large, expansive overworld, and crafting and taking quests similar to Breath of the Wild is also a plus. While it's tricky to get used to at first, the battling system is unique and issues a fresh new challenge. What's also unique is how you complete the Pokedex. Not only do you have to catch a certain Pokemon once, you also have to complete research tasks, like catching multiple or seeing it use certain moves to complete each entry. It makes sense considering your goal is to create Hisui's first Pokedex. The game is by far the most lore heavy of any Pokemon game out there, and it's really cool seeing how the Sinnoh region came to be as you progress. The characters are also well-rounded, and you may even find yourself getting attached to some of them. Honestly, we were left speechless when we got exiled from Jubilee Village. So our conclusion is Pokemon's first time deviating from the formula that we love so much actually paid off in the end because what we got was incredible and more deserving of our top spot. So hopefully we see more legend style games in the future, but let us know in the comment section what your favorite mainline Pokemon game is. 